Well, good evening. I'm glad you're here. Um, I don't normally sit when I teach, but uh, Friday I was diagnosed with the shingles, and so I'm not, I don't have the worst case, but for some reason, um, I've got pressure and a little bit of pain and standing kind of makes makes me maybe my I might cuss or something. Sorry, they, Di, Diane said let's sit you down in the chair. <laughs> she didn't want that go out over the airwaves. She's a good friend. <laughs> it is a big job, isn't it? She's got the whirlwind by the tail sometimes. Well, let's pray and ask God to come. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being our um, bridge to know God as our Father. And thank you, Abba Father, that you hear our prayer and that it is your intention that we will know you, that we will live in your presence, that even if we, like David, forget who we are and forget who you are, thank you that you never forget and that you have the path for us to come to you, um, no matter what we believe, and no matter where, what wall we run into, no matter what difficulties that we see ahead or we'll find ourselves right in the middle of. So I pray for the people here. I pray for the people on Facebook. I pray for the people who'll be watching this on YouTube. Um, I hope that you know that God knows who you are, and he cares for you, and he has a plan to give you a future and a hope. And Father, thank you that you do. And be the mouth, let's just let me be the mouthpiece tonight, Father. And I'm just grateful for another opportunity to speak well of your name. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're, we're right, uh, this is our third time, so we're right in the middle. We only have six times, right? Where's our third time? And uh, for those of you who don't know, the title is Flourishing in the Drought, Trusting God to Do Amazing Things in difficult times. And, you know, I've been <clears throat> thinking a lot as I, you know, in January, if you're a, a gardener or you like flowers, you start getting the catalogs. They start coming sometimes the end of December, but they don't usually mess with Christmas. They usually come right in January. And you begin to get all the beautiful catalogs of gorgeous flowers and gorgeous tomatoes and, and everything else you can grow and new tools you need and, and fertilizer and stuff like that. So um, I haven't had a garden in a long time, and so I've been looking at it, and it just made me think about dirt again and, and how much I learned when I uh, was a gardener for a whole s summer. And I had two separate gardens, one on both sides of my house. And, of course, I decided to do this the year that we had the worst drought that Tennessee's had in, in our history. So I was siphoning stuff off my bathtub water and, and my, 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 my sink water, and I was out there and I had a, uh, some sort of infestation, and I had like over almost 200 tomato plants, 100 on both sides, and, and I was having to touch each leaf on each plant, and... Uh, um, my, my, my little farmette, I call it, is right on the road, so my, my gardens were right where people would go by. And, and if you're out and you're working a lot, you just get frustrated. You know, stuff breaks and water goes everywhere or something. I'd be kicking something, just not cussing, but I would just be hollering. And then there'd just be farmers coming back and forth, and, and I'd go, Hey, yeah, it's been a great day. It's been a great day out here. Um, and I learned that my soil is very, A, rocky. I don't have a lot of dirt. I seem to have more rock than dirt. And then I have clay. And I learned that in clay, your roots of your um, little plants will suffocate because they get down in the clay and there's no room for the little roots to move and have space for there to be oxygen for them to, to breathe. Now, I didn't ask for clay. I got clay. And, and, and I didn't know I had clay till I started digging. So, you know, it wasn't something that I prepared for. And then where I had rock, I put in, I can't tell you how many truckloads and bags of, of things to amend my soil. 
And I learned what a mending soil was, where I had to take what I had and add in and amend it. And I learned about manure at this time. Now, I had known a lot about manure prior to this moment, but I realized that manure happens on the farm. It's just a natural product of animals on the farm. And that if you take um, manure of any animal, the, 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 you know what manure is from any animal, chickens or horses or uh, cows, whatever, you, you can't take it right out of the you know, chute. You, you just can't take it <laughs> and put it directly into your soil or onto your plants because they will die. It, it, it burns the plants slap up. Now, if you take that same poo and set it aside, and about two years of setting it aside, and add things to it like leaves and, 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 and compost, you know, your vegetables you've, you cut up, you just keep putting it in there and you, you put it in that. What the very thing that would have burned your plants up has become gold, has become something that doesn't smell, uh, doesn't have any indication that it came from poo, was manure, and, and you actually work it into the soil that you have. That's important. You work it into the soil that you have, and it will be an elixir to the roots of your plants, and your plants will begin to grow exponentially. It, they've just, it, it feeds them. And so as I was working out in the garden, you know, it's just me and the Lord and the birds and, and um, whatever else I saw out there, and, and I began to recognize this, and, and I didn't hear an audible voice, but, you know, I feel like God talks to you. Once again, I, I can kind of figure out when it's God and not God. Like when I see par people parking in a handicapped spot and they're not handicapped, I want to key that person's car. <laughs> I don't think that was from God. I'm pretty sure he didn't say key that person's car. But when God moves my heart and says things of truth to me or encourages me, go help that lady or or maybe out of my comfort zone, or reveal something to me that, that seems to be epiphanal. Everyone knows it, maybe I don't, but I realized that God said, Roseanne, the very things in your life that are stinky, that you wished had not happened, that were horrible at the time, that you thought would have broken you and discouraged you, and you just think was the worst thing that could ever happen, let it lay by. Let it lay by for a while. And I'll add things to it. I'll add things to it. And then eventually, it, that will be the very thing that I'm going to add to your soil, and it will enrich your heart. It will enrich your life. And you can tell people with utter confidence, no matter what you're going through, if it's manure-like, let it lay by. And trust that the God of the universe is going to change it, if you let him, into something that will enrich you. And it won't even look like the same thing. That's why we have a transformational God. That's why we don't serve a God who de demands that we uh, appease him. Do you know that's the difference between our living God, the big G God, and these little G gods that folks worship? A lot of times those little g-gods are the ones who demand our sacrifice to appease them. And sometimes good things happen and sometimes they don't. But our God, the big g-god, he doesn't have us worship him like that. He wants us to love him. And he wants us to know he loves us as we are. When Jesus died on the cross 2,000-something years ago, the older I get, the more years come from that date. But way back there, he died for all that we have done and will do. I don't understand that. But it was done. God and God connected and made that bridge for you and me to walk over. So through Jesus, we'll know God. 
And so that in every moment that you and I live, we live in the presence of God. And there, there's a phrase that I ran across this week, and probably all y'all know it, but it's quorum Deo. Quorum Deo. And, and, you know, what does that mean? Most of us, if we see Deo, we know it's God, something about God, especially since it's a capital. Um, and what it literally means is it's to live quorum Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, bless you, under the authority of God to the glory of God. Every moment that you and I live is to live our entire life in the presence of God. And if we believe what we've been taught and what we read in the Word, um, if you even go back to Psalm 139, if you want to go back to the Old Testament, don't even talk about Jesus at this time. God, it, the, the psalmist says, He knows when I rise up and I lie down. Before there's yet even a word on my tongue, He knows it. He knew me before my inward parts were formed in my mother's womb. He saw me while I was still in the earth. And He said, Even though I take the wings of the dove or I descend to the depths of hell, God is already there. He knows me. We have that kind of God. So when difficult times come, some of us will ask, why? Why is this happening? And I don't mean just you get a parking ticket or those are important things. But when we have things happen to us that we just don't know why. Miss Helen used to say, those are tests, Rose. God is testing us. To see what's in our heart. And I said, really? She said, yeah, go back. Do you got your Bible? <laughs> she always say that. Do you got your Bible? You got a piece of paper? Yes, ma'am. Do y'all? <laughs> Look at Deuteronomy <laughs> chapter 8. And some of us hadn't, we haven't had to do sword drill a lot. You know, we don't necessarily lit, go to a church where we're having to flip back and forth between a lot of books, so we forget where some books are. Just look at the table of contents. No, no one faults you for that. But it's in the Old Testament. If you reach Genesis, go to the right. And you're going to get to Deuteronomy chapter 8. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 8. And while some of us are looking for that, I want to read you a little poem that Thomas Merton wrote. And um, I found it in a book, and it, was, it says the source is from uh, My Argument with the Gestapo, and it's called Identity. And I carry this in my purse, in my billfold. It's as if you want to identify me, ask me not where I live or what I like to eat or how I comb my hair, but ask me what I am living for in detail and ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully for the thing I want to live for. Ask me what I think is keeping me from my living fully for the very thing that I think say that I'm living for. Sometimes I know in my life it's easy to talk about Jesus. It's easy to talk about trusting God. But when the rubber meets the road and the manure is on the ground, it's hard to sometimes see ahead that God is in charge. But when Miss Helen said, sometimes God tests us, I thought, well, he tests me all the time. I don't get a break. But I see that there's a plan and a purpose. And look what he did with the children of Israel. All the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be careful to do. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. That he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know 
that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Um, Coram Deo, I mean, living our lives all in the presence where we look and, and, and when the first time that I ever read that, and I think maybe it was with Miss, Miss Helen, I never really thought about God leading the children of Israel. I thought they wandered. Don't, have you ever heard that? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Anybody else? Or was that just me? Wandered in the wilderness. Well, Deuteronomy very specifically says that he led them in the wilderness. They didn't wander anywhere. And, and he tested them. Now, have a little... Talk back to me. Why did he test them? See what was in their hearts. If we never have tests, if God, if we never let God test us or scratch the surface, then you don't know what's in your heart. You just know what comes out of your mouth. It's easy to talk good about what you can do for God and how much we trust God. But when we really have to see in the test, it says, and he humbled you. I don't know... One person who likes to be humbled. Yeah. No. We don't like to be humbled. It says he humbled you and let you be hungry. We would think that's bad. Why would God allow us to be hungry? And this is just not physical hunger. I have talked to a lot of, of, of folks and said, you know, that might be hunger in your life for relationship, hunger in your life for many different things. And there's a good question to ask yourself. What am I hungry for today? What if I ask God to fill in my life that I, that's not been filled? What are you hungry for? It says that sometimes he lets us be hungry. Why? So he can feed us with a manna that we don't know, nor did our fathers know. Why? So that we might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We do not learn that unless we're hungry. We do not learn that unless we let God provide. And I'm saying in this moment, in this day, we live in a nation where most of us don't have to, to want for food. Most of us don't have to want for electricity. Some of us, we might not like what we wear, but we got stuff to wear. We might not like what we drive, but most of us can get where we're going. Um, the young people today, there, there's not much lack in the way that we might have known lack when we were younger or even in, in this room when you were younger, um, of growing your own food and, and living off the land and not really needing anything off the land except maybe the sugar and the coffee that you'd go into town and the, the mill where you'd have to go get your, your, your uh, flower ground. I mean, where you were self-sustaining. But I go back to this and I say, you're testing us. And that's very difficult. That is very difficult. We talked about David last week. We talked about David, and you can flip back over to 1 Samuel chapter, uh, let's remind ourselves what he did in chapter 27. Well, in chapter 27, he goes to the Philistines, right? He flees to the Philistines. Why? Because he forgot he was going to be king. 1 Samuel chapter 27. He just forgot that we were going, hey, we, we just forgot that, that, that we belong to God. We forget that he has promised to give us a future and a hope. We forget that he's promised to feed us with manna that we don't know. We forget that sometimes he lets us go beyond our ability to go so he will get the glory in his meeting our need or his being the word, the word on our tongue. You know, why are you not cursing God? Well, because I, I love God. He has a purpose. Hey, what's your name? Hey, who are you? What are, what are you doing? Well, what do you need? I mean, we are a, a, a nation that hardly ever, we hardly ask, ever ask any folks any questions. We don't know them. We scared of people. You know, in, in, in Jesus' day, when, in, in the last chapter of Luke, when he goes with the, the men on the road to Emmaus and they get to their house and it says it's getting toward evening and they ask him to come in. Nowadays, if we see somebody at our driveway toward evening, we don't ask them in for supper. We call the police. 
We don't care if we're entertaining angels unaware. They're, they're on my property at sundown. We, we, we don't have that, that overarching rule where we need to invite strangers in because we might be entertaining an angel unaware. We do not live under that anymore, I don't think. Am I wrong? Uh, I mean, some of us might. We might look out and go, that, folk, that person looks like they need some help. But my point being, we live in a different age, but we don't have a different God. He, he transcends our ages. And so when David kept being pursued by Saul, it's a familiar story. If you've been in church at all, you've done every flannel board, macaroni plate. You, you have done all these things, all the different ways that you can do. But my question is, is do you know who feeds you? Do you know who tests you and why? Do you ever forget to whom you belong? Do you ever forget that he's got a plan and a purpose for you? That you're not, uh, do you ever feel uh, insecure? Do you, do you ever feel like, I, 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 you know, I, I know I'm important to God, but not as important as Darren or not as important as CZ or not as important as those people. I mean, I can't do what they do right. That's just the point. You can't do what they do. You do what you do. You have to know that you have worth in the eyes of, of the Lord. But we forget that. We don't live in a place where, well, just to be honest, sometimes as we get older, there are not very many folks coming up and asking us our, the wealth of our knowledge, are they? They're, we're like, well, I'll, I'll help put food on the table over here, or I'll help clean up or help in the parking lot, but they're not asking you the wealth of your knowledge. Well, it's one day they will because that's how we know and that's how we tell the next generation of God's faithfulness is only if this generation tells the next generation of God's faithfulness. We have to keep telling somehow, some way. We have to keep praying, God, show me that I have a place in your kingdom, that I am important to the kingdom. Show me how I'm to do that. But we forget. And it's easy to forget when the water's coming up your nose and you're drowning. The little girl that uh, was well, not a little girl, she's a young woman. I asked on my Facebook to pray. She had a concussion. She's much better from the concussion. And today I was asking God, I'm like, okay, I know I get sick and I, I don't have a problem with that. But um, I, why do I have the shingles? <laughs> I mean, do you ever, whatever's plaguing you, do you ever just look? sometimes and say, I'm not really sure why I have this. And I said, I, I know that you've got a plan and a purpose, you know, Father, but just show me. And, and so I, I want to share something with you. Um, I, I got an email today while I was sort of thinking about my shingle problem. <laughs> and I got uh, an email, uh, uh, a text from this, this same girl, and she said, I just needed to let you know I went to the doctor late last night with 102 fever, and I have the flu. Now, she's just been catching up from having a concussion. I will not be in class today or tomorrow, doctor's orders, but I'm going to try to make it to school on Thursday. I broke down in the doctor's office crying because I don't understand why I keep getting knocked down. I am drowning in makeup work, and this is the last thing I needed I've been praying about it so much. I just wish God could give me the answers. I sound so dramatic right now, and I know, I know, but I really am having a hard time understanding it all. Anybody say amen? I've just been wondering why I got the shingles. Oh, I say, sweetheart, we're in close proximity in trouble. I was diagnosed with shingles Friday, and I need to stay home but cannot miss work. I cannot cancel my Bible study tonight because folks from all over watch on Facebook Live and then on the edited version on YouTube. I was wondering why this new trial is here. Just like you. Now I understand. We are sister travelers. God allows difficulties to teach that we can rely on nothing or on no one except him. We are strong, determined women, which is good, but we must 
see with our own eyes and taste the tears of our own disappointment and frustration that we cannot do anything on our own. We have to trust God even in our weakness, seeming failures and limitations. Concussions, flu, shingles, depression, anxiety, troubles. My spiritual mom, Miss Helen Wright, used to say that God allows suffering to come to those he has called to a deeper relationship with him, not just to suffer, but to see God in new ways. Make up work, missed classes, all will work out. You will graduate. You know, sometimes you just need to say, some, you just need somebody to say, you're going to be okay, don't you? Even if they're your same age and they're in the same boat you are, you look at each other and go, we're going to make it, at least for today. You're going to pass. You're going to graduate. You'll get through this. However, through, quotes, is the important word. And I can guarantee that God will take us both through what now appears the insurmountable problems. Now, just rest. Do not return until you're well and strong. Then we will see how God will provide. Sister sojourners, glad to be on this journey with you. Cry if required. If we're cry. Cry if required, but try out your trusting shoes. You will see me just a little further up the path saying, come on, it gets better and better. When you feel like responding, let me know what you think. Now, see, if I had not been in a hard place, wondering myself, not to the depths of this, because I have, this is not my first rodeo, most of us, we've been through quite a bit, right? Then I'm able to reach back and grab the hand of a new sister and say, you know what, sweetheart, it's tough, but we're in this together. And God is showing us who he is. Like David, she's got to learn she's anointed. She's God's anointed. But when he fled to the Philistines, he totally gave up what was to be his. And you know what? I don't think we ever get too old to ask ourselves, what did I give up on? What have I given up on that God really wants me to remember? Whether I'm 9 or 19 or 29 or 90. Is there something I just gave up on because it just got too hard? Or I've tried to outwork God. Have you ever done that? In my, my growing up, we just serve. Don't you serve? You just do all you can. You're supposed to do that. But I don't see one place where he says, serve me before you love me. So I and me, I, it's a lot easier for me to serve than just being obedient. How about y'all? I'd whole lot rather put out the food on that table on Sunday mornings than to be nice to somebody I don't like. <laughs> I got a few of those. It's all their fault, but. <laughs> What's that thing where he says, to obey is better than sacrifice? Shoot. God knows us. How do we flourish in the drought? We say, God, you've got to be through me to the world. You've got to give me the water of your spirit in the midst of this difficult time. And we're getting to a point where some of us are going to be in those places where as our bodies keep going back to the earth, it's going to be harder and harder to do the things that we're used to doing. But even in that state, we're able to say with our hearts and our mouths, blessed be the name of the Lord. Devil, it doesn't matter what you bring. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Devil's never done anything for you. Don't start listening to him now. Whose voice are you listening to? What things have you put aside because you think they're manure? And they're really not going to bring any glory to you at this moment. It'll be the very thing possibly that God's going to bring back up. We don't necessarily have a generation behind us who, who knows what it means to lose. Let's just say this, lose well. 
I don't think I've ever seen a group, and I don't say who you voted for, not voted for, I don't think I've ever seen a group be so upset by who didn't get president or who did get president and just won't shut up. I mean, I'm just like, have you never lost a ball game? I mean, Alabama, we lost this year, but we working for next year. We're getting folks to get in there, but we don't sit around and gripe every day. But that's just my own personal how it happens. You know, I'm just like, I would really like someone to be running the country. But I, I, I just couldn't, sometimes right after the, <laughs> right after the election, they were just heartbroken. And they just couldn't believe anybody wouldn't vote for their candidate and that their candidate didn't win. And I'm like, are you serious? Uh-huh, they were. So I just had to pray. <laughs> Lord, they need to know how to trust you when they lose. Most of them have gotten those participation trophies. <laughs> that doesn't help when f big stuff goes wrong <laughs> and you don't get the trophy. But I understand, don't you? I mean, it's hard to take it when things don't work out because they're just things that seem like they should be. and aren't. You know what I'm saying? How could God not allow this to happen? Because it's got to be his will. I need to be very careful. Because David said, surely, I mean, Saul's going to leave me alone because I'm the anointed. But it just, it just went on, I think, for 30 years. He just, Saul just wouldn't cooperate. He wouldn't get off the throne. So David, ever you get discouraged, go to chapter 27 in 1 Samuel and realize that David forgot he was going to be king of Israel. He just forgot because life was too hard. There was too much manure and not enough compost. So he went over and promised the king of Gath, Achish, the king of the Philistines, that he would be his bodyguard for life. And the king said, I got him now. I got him now. I mean, he's, he's made himself a fool in the eyes of his people, so he will be my faithful servant for all the rest of his life. Have you ever wondered what God was doing in heaven? Nothing but saying, I got this. Now, I believe the Bible says we have angels who guard us that the Lord sends angels to do his bidding. And, and, and if we believe the scripture, it said this room is so filled with angels, we should not be able to move if we could see them. Myriads of angels. So I've named two of mine Fred and Franklin. I just figure I'd be on the first name basis with two of mine so in case I needed to call out. And I know every now and again that my two Fred and Franklin go to the Lord and say, how much longer is she going to live? <laughs> she doesn't get it. I mean, she does, she does not get it. And, and I understand that we don't live the scriptures. We live. And then we apply scriptures. Not collective we. I'm sure none of y'all do that. But I find myself just living. I don't find myself living quorum Deo. As if I'm in the presence of God. Because I am in the presence of God. If I belong to him. I cannot go anywhere that I am not. And I believe that wherever you go, you take that presence with you. So when you go out into wherever he leads you, you're taking the presence of God with you. That's just the truth. And when David and his 600 plus folk are given Ziklag as their city, that first day that I sat down with Miss Helen in her studio, and she said, have you ever heard of Ziklag? And no, ma'am, I haven't. So she took me to 2 Samuel chapter 30. 2 Samuel chapter 30. I'm a liar. First chapter. First chapter. First Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 30. There we go. I got shingles. Give me a break. <laughs> I'm not on any pain medicine. Shoot fire. I got some, but I thought, no, I'm not taking that. 
Now, in chapter, tw- in chapter 29, David's feelings are hurt. Because Achish won't let him go battle with him. He won't let him go be his bodyguard and fight against his own people, Israel. He would have fought his own people. And yet God intervened. And how did he do it? He did it through the enemy king's soldiers. Thank you. (laughs) My kids today, I was asking a question and I pointed out the word. I'm like, it's that word. It's that very word. And they're like, I'm like, say that word, that word, say that word. <laughs> I'm like, it's not just going to float in your head. There it is in print. His, his, the soldiers of the Philistine king said, oh, wait a minute. Remember the song? Wait a minute. This is the same David. Saul killed thousands, but David kills ten thousands. I bet he's going to go against us. And, and, and they're going to get behind us, and they're going to plan an ambush, and they're going to go with their people. And it just hurt David's feelings. It hurt his feelings when Achish says, Brother, there's not been one thing that you've done. You've been like an angel in my sight. I, if I were a playwright, I would do a little one-act play on this. You have been the best guy who could ever be, and, and you have done nothing to deserve my distrust, but you got to go back to Ziklag. Because they don't want you here. And can you see them? They're kicking cans down the road. You know, they're all ready for a battle. And I always see it like this. Well, we already sharpened our swords, and we got all our arrows ready, and we don't have anywhere to shoot them. We were ready for a battle, and we got to turn around and go home. And the city that Achish had given them to live, because there's so many of them, is called Ziklag. Right there. In chapter 30. Verse 1. And when it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both great, small and great, without killing anyone and carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. They were done, undone. They were undone. Now, these are all men, right? Because the women and kids have been taken off. These are the warriors. They sat down and wept until there was no more strength in them to weep. And David was right there with them. And it said, Now David's two wives had been taken captive. So he's got two wives and children and everything else in this mix. And I love this story. It just gets better and better. Verse 6. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. I believe I would have been distressed myself. For all the people were embittered, each because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And as Miss Helen was telling me that story, she stopped and she looked at me and she said, You would like to inquire of the Lord. You would like to know God like this, huh? I said, what do you mean? He said, David strengthened himself and the Lord his God. Okay. Verse 7, David says to the priest, bring me the epod. Remember when we were talking earlier, when he went to the priest at Nob and asked for the bread, and he said, do you have any weapons? He said, we have Goliath's sword. It's back there behind the epod. Well, evidently, David took the sword and the epod when he went to the Philistines. He took all of it. And so he asked for it to come because you don't see David in the entire time that he's fighting with the Philippines, Philistines calling on God. God's not in these chapters. You don't see his doing what he has done previously. When you're in the wrong country, the wrong place, you don't normally call on God. If you look at your life and you say, you know, it's been a while since I've had a conversation with God. Well, you need to check where you're living. You might be in the wrong country. 
You may have forgotten you've been anointed. You may have forgotten God had something for you. You might be in a relationship where you should not be. You may be in a marriage where you're in a mess and you're in a bunch of mess. And, and it's difficult. And you're just as bereft as these men. And you've wept until there's no more strength in you to, to weep. And what, what you have to do is you call for the up and you call on God. And this is what David said, what it says in verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord, saying... Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, God spoke to David, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and you shall surely, you shall rescue all. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him. They got to this river, this brook, and, and 200 of the men were just too tired to go on. So he left 200 men on one side of the brook, and 400 men and David went across and, and pursued the Amalekites. And they found an Egyptian, and, and, and uh, you know, they're asking him what happened, and, and um, it said that they were all dancing, and they're spread out over the land, verse 16. They're eating and drinking and dancing because all the great spoil that they've taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah, verse 17, and David slaughtered them until the twilight. Until the evening of the next day, not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. And David recovered all the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. But nothing of theirs was missing, whether great or small, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that they had taken for themselves. David brought it all back. When Miss Helen finished that story, she looked across the little card table at me and she said, you would like to inquire of the Lord like that, wouldn't you? And I remember looking at her and I said, if it's available, why wouldn't we all inquire of God? I mean, if that's available, I am 28 years old, been a Christian at that time, been a Christian since I was five, been brought up in the church, been to... Bible studies once I got to college and, and got out of my Baptist college, which was academic excellence in a Christian environment. They locked us up at night. We didn't learn a whole lot about God. But once I got out of there and was in a Bible study and began to learn, you know, the Bible, I began to see a way that you live, but I just didn't know how to do it. I, I, I just couldn't make that connection. Like, how do you live that life of faith? I looked at Miss Ellen, and I, and I saw her, and she had told stories like, I needed a bookcase. And so I prayed, and God said, Helen, go to Kmart. And I looked at her, and I said, hey, God told you to go to Kmart? Yes. Can you beat that? No, ma'am. No, ma'am, I can't. Well, I went to Kmart, and I said, Lord, where should I look? Because I had already thought... You don't need to pray and ask God where to go get a bookcase. You go buy a bookcase where they got them, right? Why would you pray about a bookcase? Well, silly me. So she tells the story of going to Kmart. She sees, yes, she tells this young man what she needs. He takes her to the blue light special lane. And there is this one left and... And uh, she said, I think that'll be perfect. And he said, well, it's going to be this much. And she said, oh, I don't have that much. I only have a little bit. So he goes and checks, and he comes back. And he says, manager says, we can sell it to you for that. She says, perfect. Would you like it? Yes. So she gets to the uh, cashier line, and she said, Lord, I need someone to help me get this to my car. And right then this nice young man comes up and says, ma'am, do you need some help getting this to your car? Yes. So he got it in my car, and I got to my apartment, and I live on the second floor, and I said, Lord, I need someone to help me get this up to my apartment. And right then the groundskeeper came and knocked on the window and said, Miss Wright, do you need some help getting that up to your apartment? Yes. He put it right. It fit right in the place. He, she said, my journals fit in it, and I didn't know till later that her journals were the size of album covers. Are y'all old enough to remember album covers? Well, they're coming back now. Album covers. It, if I'd gotten a bookcase, they wouldn't have fit. She needed a stereo cabinet. One with the push. Remember those? You push the glass and it pops open. That's what she got. I saw it when I went to her apartment. And her journals just fit perfectly, just like album covers. Just perfect. If I'd gotten a bookcase, those would not have fit. But she prayed. 
she inquired of God, and he told her to go to Kmart. <laughs> David inquired of God, what shall I do? And he told him. And when she said to me, you would like to inquire of God like that, I not only had David, but I had Miss Helen sitting in front of me, and she had told story after story after story after plain old story of how God had provided. She had asked, and he had led. And I said, if it's available, you bet your life I want it. And you know what she said? It was hard. She didn't call me Roseanne. It must have been too long. Rose. Although Rose took long enough to say, I'm sure that's, Rose, first you have to learn to strengthen yourself in your God. And I realized I didn't know how to do that. Do you know how to strengthen yourself in your God? We all want to ask, so he'll tell us, so he'll lead us, so we'll get the spoil back, so we'll do it. But are we in knowledge of how we strengthen ourselves in our God. I was 28 when I heard that story, and I'll be 64. That's my boyfriend. <laughs> Tell him I'll be out in a minute. You never know who calls. It just might be your boyfriend. I forgot what I was saying. Yeah, you strengthen yourself with God, but you don't know. I mean, you see something, and, and I want to know how to do that, but it takes the ability to sit down and begin to get to know this God. And some of the things that I saw that, that um, David did not write this, but Psalm 71, verse 18, you can just jot these down and look at them later. Psalm 71, verse 18, those of y'all, hey, Rosemary, Rosemary lives all the way over and the other continent. What are you doing up so? Maybe it's early, late. I don't know which one it is, but I love you. Psalm 71, 18. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare thy strength to this generation, thy power to all who are to come. That was one of Miss Helen's verses, and I've adopted as one of mine. Psalm 73, 23, and 24. Asap wrote this. Nevertheless, Psalm 73, 23 and 24. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast taken hold of my right hand. With thy counsel, thou will guide me, and afterwards receive me to glory. Psalm 73, verse 25 and 26. Just a couple of verses past that one. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength and the and the Literal translation of the word strength is rock. God is my rock. He is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. Do you know when you talk about how the Jews viewed God, they weren't Greeks. Greeks liked equations. Greek liked adjectives. Hebrew folks liked nouns. God is a rock. God is my strength. God is the sun. He is the bread. He, he was not... He didn't have much adjectives with the Hebrews. I loved it because when I finally discovered it, I was so glad to be a Hebrew and not a Greek. I'm like, God, I hate math. I hate outlines. I'm a Hebrew. I love stories. That must not have... Y'all Y'all must all be Greek. <laughs> And then verse 28 of that same psalm, But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of thy works. Why do we make God our refuge? So we can tell of his works. And you know, it doesn't, it's, it's not big, you know, big, humongous answers to prayer. It's do you see him in your moments? Did the baby quit crying when you asked? Or, or, or did you see something that the sky was just amazing? Or, or I, I was out working in the, in the garden, and I, and I had a bluebird box, and all of a sudden I was down on the bottom of it, and I saw this bluebird beak sticking out. So I had brought my camera out, so I kept walking up, just clicking as the whole time I was walking up till I was directly in front of that, and there was this little baby bluebird just 
His, he was hollering. His mouth was open. He thought I was the mama. I know that's what he was doing. But it's sure like he was. And I looked inside, and he was standing on top of all his sisters. It had to be a boy. He was right there stepping on all the girls, and he wanted the first worm that came, and he was hollering. And so then, in a moment, he just lay his head down on that little circle, that little opening, and I got a picture of it. And there's just this little bluebird just. He looks like he's smiling. Those of you who say, he looks like he's smiling. He's resting. And I, well, I didn't know I'd caught it till I got it inside and pulled it on the computer and started pulling up, and I thought, that is amazing. That's a shot in a million. And the Lord said, that's what I want you to be, Roseanne. You're always, be careful, don't step on folks to get up to the front, try to get the worm, you know, crying and squawking. Just rest in me. Take your refuge in me, and then you'll tell of the works I've done. That's the best thing we can tell. When was the last time Paul came and spoke in our church? How about Peter? Timothy? All these folks are dead. They're dead. But you and I are alive. So God takes the stories of here and he puts them with our stories. And that shows that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we don't tell stories, the story does not continue. That's how God has gotten the gospel through all the generations and the centuries is through you and through me. Now, some of our stories are different. Some of us have come from addiction. Some of us fight addiction every day. Some of us have killed people. Some of us are burglars. Some of us have, we're criminals. But you know what? Before God, our sin is sin. He still saves us. Sometimes God allows us to go through things so we can get the text of a little one and say, baby, we're in the same place. Can you believe it? We're going to make it through. God shows us his mercy. Now, this is a psalm of David, and if you will, turn to Psalm 40. Turn to Psalm 40, verse 1. Oh, I'm a liar. Let's go to Psalm 34. We'll look at Psalm 40 another day. 34, Psalm 34. This is the one I want to talk about just to finish up with because this is... The psalm that David wrote after he dribbled and scribbled on the gates of, of Achish. Remember that last week when he acted like a madman? He got afraid. He got scared. And so he acted like a madman and he just scribbled on the gates. And the, and the king said, do I not have enough madmen in my kingdom? You have to bring another one. I just think that's funny. The Bible is really funny if you'll read it out loud. I mean, I just think that's funny, can the king. We're going to... Maybe next week. We're going to look at Jehoshaphat and Ahab. That has got to be, in, in 1 Chronicles 18, that's got to be one of the funniest things that's ever written in the whole Bible, what they say to one another. <laughs> How do you, it, that's funny. Okay, Psalm 34. And it says in my Bible, a Psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, which is Achish, who drove him away and he departed. And this was the result after David saw that God cared for him and provided for him, this is what he wrote. And my, my encouragement to you this week is to think of something God has brought you through and you didn't deserve it. Okay? He just rescued you. What would you write? What would you write down in praise of God? and telling others what he's done. This is what David wrote. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. Now remember when his, his boast was in himself, he got afraid and he dribbled and scribbled. Remember? When he had his own trust in himself, he got afraid when he, when he was put in that position. So he's decided, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. All you dribble and scribblers, let's all exalt God's name together. 
He does not remember our foolishness. If he did, none of us would make it to heaven. I sought the Lord. I inquired of the Lord. And he answered me and delivered me from all my what? Fears. What can take us down quicker than shingles or the flu? Fear. I get afraid. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man, this afflicted man, literally cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Miss Helen is the first one in 1983 to read me this psalm, and I sucked it in like sugar water to a diabetic. I was so wounded. I could not believe that there was a psalm that spoke my heart. I was afflicted. You mean one day I'll be not afflicted? I'll be able to say that I sought the Lord and he delivered me from all my fears? Yes. Here it is. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Mine, I've got Fred and Franklin right there. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed. How blessed is the man or woman who takes refuge in him. Second time we've seen the, the word refuge. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, and to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Now some of you are hearing this way over in, in foreign lands in the night your belly's rumbling and, and you don't have adequate shelter and you know children who are refugees and they don't have what they need. We lift it up to the Father because somehow, some way, it says those who seek the Lord shall never be in want of any good thing. Make it so, Lord Jesus. Make it so. Help us to make it so. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. That has gotten me through many a dark time. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Some of you hearing this today are crushed in spirit. It's, life is not just hard. Your spirit is crushed. Then go to the Lord. Lay on the floor in front of him and say, if you don't rescue me, I will not be rescued. Because only God can rescue us. Why? Because we want to be independent. We want to take care of ourselves. That's the American way. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to. But what I'm saying is, is that he keeps coming back and saying, little children depend totally on me. And that's something I have to constantly go back to. How do I do that as a strong woman? How do I do that as a single woman? How do I do that in trusting you? 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him and her out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. They refer back to this about Jesus. None of his bones are broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Remember in Psalm 27 when, God, when David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? You have to keep saying this stuff to yourself over and over again. Why do you think David keeps saying it in his songs? Because he needs to hear it. You just, it's not like, a, remember... <laughs> I don't know if they still do it now, but when we got the, the vaccine for a pol no, smallpox, and, you know, you, 
we took it and it's supposed to have this big sore and the sore when it went away left a little scar and that was everybody's badge of courage you know that was our honor that little thing well mine didn't take I didn't ever get a blister so I didn't have a scar there I was in first grade no scar and they're like what's wrong with you you gonna have to you gonna have you don't have a scar and I'm like to my mom I don't have a scar nothing happened so she had to take me back down to the little lady and say got no scars <laughs> They gave it to me again. I got this little, I must be really healthy. She got this little bitty thing, and I got this little bitty scar, but finally I got a scar. You know, some of us, we have these badges. We still have them. We do. Some of them were really big. They were like craters. You know, I'm like, oh, yuck. And some of them had to have those, remember, they had to have that big old thing over them, taped over it so nobody would touch it. So no, can't touch that. It'll mess up the scar, I guess. I don't know. But we all have those badges that we wear and we go, you know, I've, I've trusted God and he's, he's taking care of me. And I just, we just need to say, in all of us in our lives, he is our light and our salvation. Not anything you've done. Jesus did it on the cross. He paid for our sins. He paid for you and me to be here and be able to read this. He paid for when Dine and I and other people get to go to foreign nations and tell about Jesus and see his wonderful works. And, and I can't explain it. I can't explain it. But I know he's with us. I know he's directing us. And I know it because Coram Deo. We're living in the presence, doing everything in the presence of God. Let's pray. Lord, help us know what our identity is. Help us to ask ourselves, what's keeping me from, from doing and being the thing that I say is the most important thing in my life, what I say I'm about? I think a lot of people who, follow, who say they're Christ followers uh, it's easy to say those things, but when things get hard or uh, when it keeps going, we're, we're, we are quick to, to say, I'm just struggling. I, I just don't know, and somehow it doesn't really matter. I remember that day when Miss Helen looked across the table from me and said, you want to know how to inquire of the Lord that way, don't you? And I said, if it's available, I sure do. And I am learning still how to strengthen myself in you, Father. That doesn't mean we don't like football. That doesn't mean we don't enjoy things. That doesn't mean we don't have things. That don't mean anything. It just means that we are learning to strengthen ourselves in you and to be aware of your presence and acutely aware of your sovereignty in everything. So I pray that you would go with all of us this week, all who are listening, all who will hear. Share this with friends and people who need to have hope. There is no hope except in the Lord. All else fails. Thank you for another opportunity to speak well of your name, Father. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Next week, we're going to look at Jehoshaphat and Ahab. So we're going to look at, that's going to be Second Chronicles. Just start with 18. Start with 18. We're going to read. There's background information that you need, but we really get into the story. Well, we get in the story in 18, we really do. And then we'll go through. Twenty, chapter 20. You know, you can read as much as you want. You don't have to just read what I sign. Y'all have a good week. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.